countdown. So sorry, so we've been chatting away and forgetting the time, forgive us. So we're a few minutes late. So welcome to those that are online and welcome to those of you that are in here the building as well. Great to see everybody. Hope all the kids have had a fantastic half term. Very exciting having a week off, isn't it? So I've got a question, just following on from last week's sermon that was talking about the generosity of God. I've got a quick question for you to share with the people around you. I want you to think of what's the most generous gift someone has ever given to you, okay? So say hello to the person next to you and quickly share with them what's the most generous gift that someone has given to you. What's the most generous gift you've had? Okay, you said that I need to say it for him. A Hot Wheels crash tower was the most generous thing that you've had. What, what about you? Lego TIE fighter. A Lego TIE fighter. Oh, it's coming down here. Wow. Somebody wants to send me a thousand pounds. Wow. Wow, anyone can beat that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that? Okay. Our mother gave us life. Ah, oh, that's a beautiful one, isn't it? Mum gave us life. Definitely. What's the most generous thing that someone's given you? My phone. A phone. Fantastic. The most generous thing that someone's given me was a car. That's pretty, and not the Hot Wheels variety, but an actual petrol one to drive, which was amazing. And then, and then we had to say bye bye to it. I did have to say goodbye to it, because eventually, eventually it died after many years. Is that because you put it in the Hot Wheels crash tower? I didn't put it in the crash tower, no. Well, no. That, at least. But another car did hit me, and that was the end of the story, unfortunately. But it was a major blessing from Jesus. So last week we were thinking about God being super, super generous. And he is, isn't he? And while Graham was kindly preaching and sharing really brilliantly from us on the word, there was a kid's song that's very cheesy that was going through my head the whole time. And mine as well. And Dan's as well. So we thought we'd do it. Why not? Just stay in bed that learning. So we're going to teach it to you this morning. It's very simple. Um, there's only a verse in the chorus to it, so we're going to teach you the chorus. If you don't know the Which, actions, don't do them. Right, make up your own actions. There are actions, but we don't know them either. So, um, the chorus is very straightforward. It goes like this. Our God's generous, he gives to all of us. Yeah. 
generous to us and gives us lots of life. We thought we would think about who might need some generosity at the moment and we've got a few cards and some paper and if you are under the age of 14 I'd really like some help. Would you be willing to come and draw some pictures on this card for me or write some words of what you think people might need whether that's people that are poorly in our community, for example, or it might be bigger world issues like thinking about Ukraine. So can I have some volunteers to come and give me some words and write them down for Jesus us, please? Me. Come on, Russ. I'm going to draw something that, that people You might use this space just to have some quiet time with Jesus now and send some prayers up for yourself from friends and family that you know that have got some needs. for our food bank. So you bless the staff that work in there and 
bless those that come to visit it. In Jesus' name, amen.
thank you that you are our in our lives. That when you speak, you scatter darkness. And when you speak, the church awakens and we wake up as well. So Father God, I pray that just as we continue this morning, you will open our eyes. Father, we thank you for our young children. We thank you for our youth and kids. We pray that as they go out to their group this morning, that you will bless their time together and their time with you. We thank you for them, Lord. We thank you for the joy that they bring to our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. The kids are heading out now. And can you take your balloons with you? Fun out in Kids Church. We're going to um, continue our time together in worship this morning. Um, I was wondering. Uh, earlier actually about how um, I can't remember when it was but I'm sure someone talked earlier a few weeks ago about posture and intent um, and the way that we approach things um, impacts how we actually do something. So I'd like you to invite you this morning to actually be um, intentional about your worship. Um, I've heard other people say that posture is, is very important during worship and rather than just sort of sitting back and relaxing, we should actually actively participate in worship. So what I'd like to invite you to do, if you're able and willing, is just to stand up and put your hands out as if you're about to receive a gift. Um, because worship is actually a gift from God. And it's something that we do um, because we can, not because we're obliged to, not because we're forced to, but because we can, and it's such a privilege and such an honour to be able to worship our God. And I'd just like to invite you to engage this morning in any way that you're comfortable with. Um, there is space if some people want to come and dance or lie down at the front or stand at the back, sit down, kneel, just do whatever you feel God's leading you to do this morning.
may the people in Alsager and surrounding towns lift up the name that is above all other names and honour and respect your name. May you be worshipped and adored in these communities. Lord, may your kingdom rule be evident in all Sager and surrounding towns. May the kingdom of heaven be established in these communities. May your will be done in each and every person's life in these communities. May the fullness of your kingdom authority be made known and welcomed. May your will be expressed in these communities as it is in heaven. Provide this day for the people in Alsager and surrounding towns, and may forgiveness flow between them. Help them to lay down vengeances and hatred. May the temptations of the evil one be eliminated from their lives, and may those who live here be delivered from the power of the evil one. May your kingdom, power, and glory be welcomed in these communities. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Amen. I just feel like we should do a follow-up to that. Um, this might seem a little bit weird to some of you, but we're in the middle of Alsager here. And so, if you want to either turn or just reach your hand towards where you're living in Alsager and then just pray a blessing either in your head or out loud just as I continue to pray and just make that blessing over Alsager personal to you and your neighbourhood and your neighbours and your street just that, extend that blessing that we've just prayed directly into your streets and your neighbours just pray we all pray out loud together, it won't be embarrassing. But just for like 10 seconds or so, just pray out blessing to your neighborhood and your street.
Father God, that we might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit to come and live on the inside of us. That we're forever yours as a result of the blood that you shed on the cross. And Father, we take the bread and we take the wine and we remember what you did for us that we might be forgiven. And we extend that forgiveness to other people that have hurt us too. that we walk in the blessed blood of Jesus. said on the night he was betrayed take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me let's share it together in the same way afterwards he took the cup of little individual ones but he said take drink this is my blood which is shed in promise and covenant for you do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me let's do that we know that as we've done so we have declared and proclaimed that Jesus died for us until the day that he comes again. Amen. 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 Great to see you. Why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, you are looking especially lovely today. we're going to do in just a moment but before we do that let's uh, just share a couple of announcements with you let me just move this chair so that i don't trip over it <laughs> otherwise this will turn into a comedy routine which um, might not be a bad thing but you know um so fantastic so a couple of couple of announcements just just to to make not really going to uh, spend a lot of time on that um, but uh, thinking ahead to, to uh, some of the events that are going to be happening um, uh, coming up fairly soon, um, obviously the, a big one is our church party, which is happening on Saturday the 12th of November, so just a, a few weeks away. And just to remind you that we really do need people to sign up for that so that we know exactly what it is. It's fantastic, we have over 30 people that have done that already, and so in a sense, um, in a sense the sort of the fear that we wouldn't have numbers to make it a viable thing is sort of finished, but we'd still like you to sign up for that so that we know exactly who's coming, because quite apart from anything else, it's going to be a shared meal together, a meal together at that party, and we want you to put down um, you know, an idea of what maybe you're going to be able to bring to that, if at all. Of course, if you're not, don't feel that you're able actually to contribute anything. That's absolutely fine. Come along anyway, because uh, we would much rather have you there than not there. Of course, because it's a family thing, and we recognise it may not be possible for everybody 
to, uh, to, to contribute and to take part. But if you can, that's obviously going to help us. And we'd like you to write down. You know when we have our church meals together, we almost leave it up to, uh, to chance what, what everybody brings and then just plugs in the gaps. We don't really want to be doing that. Um, at the last minute at the party. We would like to have a a rough idea of the kind of foods that are going to come so that we can plan in advance um, to plug any gaps that we might need need to do. And as well as that, um, if you feel that you would like to put on a little bit of entertainment, a little bit of a show, uh, just a, a very short thing, just to kind of, you know, make it a part of the atmosphere, we'd like you to put that down as well. If any of you can tap dance, if any of you can sing, if any of you can juggle, you know, the kind of thing. You know, um, it would be absolutely fantastic if uh, you could just give us an idea of what it is that you would like to do or would be willing to do. That's on the 12th of uh, November and I think we said, have we said 6 o'clock? I think so, yeah. That's the right time. The, ch- the, the time has changed in my brain a number of times uh, to, take, uh, to take account of different things that have, have come up um, on that day. So, uh, 6 o'clock. Uh, it's going to be a real family event as well. So, uh, and feel free to bring, if you've got, uh, you know, want to bring some guests along to that as well, please do that. That would be fantastic. Um, then uh, very exciting is, and, and we're asking you to pray and to speak to, uh, to Dan and Sarah if you want to know more details. Um, we are going to uh, start our cafe church uh, the following day. Isn't that exciting? These are, kind of, these are kind of two almost taster sessions in one sense um, because uh, and we'll, we'll start proper in the new year, but we felt we wanted to do a November one and a December one, just with a, a sort of a Christmassy theme, just to lead us up to that, and uh, and that's going to be absolutely fantastic, starting uh, Sunday the 13th of November at half past four. Uh, so as I say, if you want to know more details about that, uh, please speak to Dan and Sarah about that, they'll be happy to tell you all about that, and please, please, please be praying. Now, just in case some of you are thinking, well, hang on a minute, that's the second su- uh, Sunday of the month, and indeed the, the next one will be, because that will be on the 11th of December, um, and we talked about the fact that we wanted to get our meals up and running again, our church meals up and running. Well, we're, gonna, we're really looking that we'll, we'll make the new year our start for doing our church meals together, um, just, to try and, uh, just to try and get these two dates, dates in. And then uh, in the new year, uh, either the cafe church will start meeting on a different month, or indeed there's no reason why we have to have our church meals on the second Sunday of the month, just because that's when we've always done it. We could pick another weekend for that, couldn't we? So we're going to actually just take a look at the diary and see what actually works out best for both. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then we'll, uh, we'll know what we're doing in the new year. But we're really looking forward to that as well, uh, as we said, to have those, those regular fellowship meeting together, eating together times uh, again, which we've not been tremendously consistent with since we started doing them again um, after COVID. We've really just got a couple more in. And then um, if I can just mention something, it's not in your notices, um, uh, but, uh, but it will be from next week. We are all, all also thinking about the fact that at the end of the month, on the 27th of November, um, it will be the light switch on uh, event and the Christmas market event. And uh, we always like to open the coffee shop. Um, on that night and we we are always therefore looking for volunteers to help us to do that we don't do the full range of food and all of that kind of stuff we just sell some drinks and some snacks on those days Um, but uh, we're really you know looking for some help to uh, to run that we usually again do that in shifts starting in about sort of four o'clock ish I think half past three four o'clock ish and then doing sort of hour or hour and a half shifts um, right through to the end of, of the event and then the, the pack away afterwards. So if you think that you might be able to help us with that, um, again, um, 
that would be absolutely brilliant. It's just wonderful to invite the community in to publicise our coffee shop, to uh, to try and engage with people, um, and uh, to to start our preparations for our own Christmas programme in people's minds as well, which is fantastic. Okay, let's come to God's word next of all, shall we? And uh, there's a story about two twins that were talking together inside their mother's womb. And one of the twins turns to the other one and says, Do you know, out there is an entire world waiting to be explored. There are mountains and rivers and fields and waterfalls. There are incredible uh, cities and towns with big, tall buildings and, and, and houses. There are even all kinds of different animals like cats and dogs and hippos and giraffes. It's so exciting. And people do play all kinds of amazing games like football and cricket and they have such a good time. And the other one turned around and said, don't be silly. Everybody knows there's no life after birth. <laughs> Interestingly enough though, 82% of adults aged 18 to 24 believe that a person's spirit exists in an afterlife following death. And you're already beginning to get a hint at what we're going to talk about today, I'm sure. Um, because we've come to the next part of, our, of a series that we've been doing over the course of the year, what we've called Life Perspectives, uh, where we've picked up on various... Uh, topics and subjects of belief that we think that if we can embed into our lives, if we can get a, a sense of a foundation and ground them into our beliefs, then they can be a rock upon which we stand. If we can really get a hold of these truths that the Bible teaches, they can be an amazing uh, strength for us, giving us a confidence and a security and even a transformative effect upon our lives. And a couple of weeks ago when I did the last one, I actually reminded us of all of the subjects that we've looked at. So I'm not going to do that again today. We are coming very close to the end of this series with I think just one more to do and I will remind us of them all again when I come to that. But they're all based upon uh, Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Church, which of course is a book that has informed quite a bit of our teaching over the last couple of years uh, and influenced it and inspired it. So today we're going to look at what the Bible says about the afterlife or life after death. And our opening story, of course, was meant to be a kind of a cheeky um, comment on the fact that many, many people don't believe that anything actually happens after we die. But interestingly enough, our statistic... And I don't know how old that statistic is, I do need to say, but that statistic, and many others like it, does seem to indicate that actually people are open to the idea that there is something beyond the grave, even if it's very fluid in terms of what people think that might be. And I wonder why that is. I wonder why people in this age in which we live still, when they don't necessarily have a belief uh, uh, in God or anything like that, have this sense that there might be something more to this universe than just the life that we live here. Maybe it's because they want, want that to be the case. They like the idea that actually they might not be facing the end. I'm sure that's got something to do with it. I also believe, however, that as that old saying goes, God has placed eternity in the hearts of man. God has said, uh, has done something. God has caused an awareness, even a subconscious awareness of life after death, of something more of himself and of more than that, even if people are not consciously aware of it. That be the case, the Bible certainly makes it clear that there is life after death. Hebrews 9.27 says, Just as people are destined to die once and after that, to face judgment. Revelation 1.18, I am the living one. I was dead and now I am, and look, I'm alive forever. 
and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. And John 5, 28 to 29, do not be amazed. The time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those that have done what is evil will be condemned. Now I think that last verse in particular tells us some, some, uh, something very, very important. Please don't think that, by the way, that it is when it says that uh, those who have done good and those who have done evil, it's actually saying that it's all about our own good works or bad works. It's all about our own efforts or lack of. It's talking very much about works that are accompanied by God's acceptance of his grace. God's acceptance of this free gift of salvation, without which none of us can go to heaven. But accompanied with that, having received that, there is this presentation of an expectation, if you like, in the Bible, that God's people will do good works because of the grace that they've received. But the point, actually, that that verse really shows us is that actually life after death is something that everyone regardless of whether they follow Jesus or not, is going to experience. The difference actually is what it will be. And because for everyone, death is not the end, but only the beginning. Let's come out and say it, shall we? Heaven and hell are real places. Heaven and hell are real places. We don't like talking about hell much. I certainly don't. <coughs> there are some preachers that seem to love it down throughout the ages. I'm not saying that he was one of them, but does anybody remember the Reverend Ian Paisley? Yes. Yeah, yeah, do you remember him? And you won't, uh, you immediately his accent is, is floating through your hair, and I'm not going to use his accent for fear of coming across as racist. So I don't want to do that in any way. But uh, he, 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 was, uh, he was obviously, as well as a minister, he was a unionist uh, policy. Don't actually remember which of the unionist parties in Northern Ireland he belonged to. I'm sure he would have an awful lot to say and a very firm opinion of all of the debates that are going on in Northern Ireland at the moment. But what we forget about is that as well as being involved in politics, he was also a church leader. He also led a church. He preached every Sunday at a church. And it does appear, a friend of mine from Northern Ireland tells me that he was a bit of a hellfire preacher. There is a story of one time when he was, was preaching and he says, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. One little old lady in the congregation put her hand up and said, excuse me, but what happens if you don't have any teeth? <laughs> he turned around and he said, teeth will be provided. <laughs> but some people absolutely love talking about that kind of stuff. We don't necessarily like talking about it that much. In fact, as I looked at the title in the uh, Rick Warren's book that we were coming up to, and uh, saw what it was about, I thought, oh, and I was very tempted to skip over the hell bit and just talk about heaven. But of course, the reality is, the thing that we have to face is that we can't really do that. We can't avoid subjects just because they are difficult. We can't avoid subjects just because they are unfashionable. We need to speak the truth and tell the whole story. And Jesus certainly didn't shy away from this subject. In Matthew 10, he says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And just to clarify, that's not the devil, that's God. Okay? It's better. Then in another place, it says, It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where worms that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched. Now in those verses we read about suffering, we read about fire, we get the impression, don't we, that hell is a terrible place to, to be. But what exactly is hell? Okay, what exactly is hell? Well, there are different opinions and different ideas. 
There's one group of people, for example, called the Annihilationists. Okay, and they're a group of Christians and scholars who believe that hell is the destruction and the ending of existence for those people that have been condemned. Okay, now this is not just a fringe group. Okay, this is, this is a group made up of some very prominent and actually very conservative, respected Bible scholars. Some of you may have heard of the late Dr. John Stott. Um, as a classic example of someone who held this view. And the argument is just that the word destroy there simply means that. God is just going to end their existence. They would claim that each of the Bible passages relating to the subject can also be interpreted in that way. And you know something? There is something in me that would really love them to be right. Do you know what I mean? I mean, actually, if I'm honest... There's, there's something in me that would really love to be able to believe the idea that actually everybody went to heaven regardless. Yeah? I'd really love to be able to believe that. I don't, and I can't, and it's not true, but I'd really love it to be. Wouldn't you? Come on, let's be honest. Wouldn't you? Yeah. 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 And failing that, I'd love them, these guys to be right. That actually... Um, the, the sinner and the unbeliever just get ended rather than just it being an eternal punishment. That sits so much better in me, for me in terms of comfort. But it's really hard to get around verses like Matthew 28, 46 that says, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. It's really hard to get around verses like Jude chapter 1, verse 7. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. And in that case, therefore, what is hell? Well, forget, please, if you will, the image of little red creatures, of people with horns and tails and pitchforks poking people. That actually owes more to Dante's Peak than it does the Bible. Forget, too, please, will you, the idea that Satan, that, that, that hell is somehow Satan's kingdom where he sits upon a throne and rules over the whole thing. That's not what the Bible teaches either. This is what Jesus says. Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. You see, hell is the place that God has set aside for the devil's punishment. Forget too, perhaps, the idea that people are actually in hell now. Hell is actually a lake of fire that the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation. And only after judgment will anyone actually end up there. They're presumably somewhere now. And by the sound of it, it's not pleasant either. But it actually technically isn't. It appears hell. Let me read to you what it says in the book of Revelation. When a thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them for battle. In number they are like the sand on the seashore. They march across the breadth of the earth and surround the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And then I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the book. The sea gave up the dead that were in it and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them and each person was judged according to what they had done then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire the lake of fire is the second death and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire I don't know about you but I'm feeling quite uncomfortable now aren't you I imagine all of us feeling a little bit uncomfortable right now. 
But you know, God and the Bible, let's just say it, have no obligation whatsoever to make us feel comfortable. God's under no obligation whatsoever to do that. And God cannot forget or ignore sin. Let's say that. The only thing that can be done about sin is it has to be dealt with. You either deal with it by forgiveness or you deal with it by punishment. God would love to deal with it by forgiveness. But if he doesn't get the chance, he'll deal with it by punishment. And the punishment will fit the crime. Because we'll start to see just how serious sin actually is when we see the seriousness of the punishment. God doesn't laugh at sin. God doesn't make a joke about sin. God doesn't dismiss sin. He has mercy towards sin when he can. But he doesn't diminish it. He doesn't lessen it. It's the serious thing that put his son upon the cross. But the good news is that hell is not God's plan for people. Rather, he has made a way to heaven. And his desire is that each one of us has those doors opened to be there. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 11 says, And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The way, the only way, let us say, that has been made is through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It says salvation is found in no one else because no other name has been given under heaven by which we can be saved. Sin had to be punished. And for us to be forgiven, that punishment had to fall upon Jesus. And that is why he went to the cross. He went to the cross not as an example of love, although it was. Not as um, a demonstration of the character of God, although it was. He went to the cross to be punished for you and for me and the wrong that we had done. Let's, let's lay it out, out there. Because we live in a time when people are saying, oh, God, God doesn't judge sin. Oh, the cross wasn't about sin. The cross was, 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 was an example of how we should love one another. No, it wasn't. Well, yes, it was. But primarily, it was the way that you and me could be rescued from the eternity and the punishment that we deserved because of our actions. Let's lay it out there and say it. It is the truth. It is the truth. So what's heaven like? Can we find out what heaven's like? Yeah? An elderly couple passed away and found themselves at the pearly gates. Peter was there to welcome them. And the first thing he showed them was their mansion. And it was amazing. The man was overwhelmed by the sheer luxury of it all and said, how much did this cost per night? Sir, said Peter, this is heaven. It doesn't cost anything. Then Peter took him to the dining room, where table upon table were piled high with the most delicious foods that you could, that you could imagine. And again, overwhelmed by the glory of it all, the man asked, how much for the meals? And Peter said, you forget. This is heaven. It's free. The man was a bit of a golf fan. So Peter then took him to this most fantastically beautiful golf course that you have ever seen. And the man stood there absolutely open-mouthed as he gazed around it. And Peter said, now before you ask, <laughs> there are no greens fees. This is heaven. Everything is free. The man turned to his wife and said, you and your confounded healthy eating regimes. I could have been here 10 years ago. <laughs> That's a joke, but it illustrates, of course, that heaven is an incredible place. Heaven is a place that you want to be. A lady came to speak to a pastor and said, Pastor, I'm dying to get to heaven. He says, yes, my love, that's how people usually get there. 
Let's read Revelation chapter 21, 1 to 4. When my silly phone allows me to. Just talk among yourselves. Mm -hmm. Three, two, one. There we go. Listen to this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Let's skip to verse 10. And he carried me away to the, in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south and three on the west. The walls of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve and the apostles of the Lamb. The, the angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square, as long as it was wide. He measured it with the, the city with a rod and found it to be twelve thousand stadia in length, as wide and high as it was long. The angel measured the wall using hum, human measurements, and it was 144 cubits deep. Thick. The wall, the wall was made of jasper, the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a gate, the fourth emerald, the fifth oints, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were made of pearls. Each gate was made of a single pearl. The great street of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I didn't see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city doesn't need a sun or a moon to shine in it, for the glory of God gives it light. The Lamb, lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light. The kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. Not on no day will its gates ever shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honour of the nations will be brought to it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as, as, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city, on the side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They won't need the lamp uh, or, or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever what a description important to say that this describes the new Jerusalem there is you know it does appear from this, this words that there will be a new heaven and a new earth but if that's the case then the current heaven is just the same let me tell you that it's just as beautiful it's just as glorious and the Christian is guaranteed to be there. The Bible talks in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I think, not 5, maybe 5, that, I've written it down wrong, I think, um, that we are at the moment in the body, but absent from the Lord. But that one day, we will be away from the body and present with the Lord. That's absolutely amazing. Coming back to the subject of hell just for a second, it's often been said that the worst thing about it will be that there, 
that God will not be there. Even, even atheists, I think, while of course they're totally unaware of it, are subconsciously, they have a sense of God in the world. In hell there will be none. But heaven, however, will be the total opposite. You see, even the Christian, with the best relationship with God going, and that wouldn't be me, I don't think, but even the Christian, with the most enviable, incredible relationship and closeness to God, will still find a time when God seems far away. Will still find a time when it, it doesn't seem to be happening for them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah? That's why we should never trust our feelings. God is always with us. His word tells us so. But the reality is, you see, that what's happening is that the physical world can take our attention. You see, like a battle between heaven and earth for our consciousness, our minds struggle to focus on heaven because earth takes our attention too strongly. We worry about material things. Our experience of God can be limited by our own physical limitations. And the verse that we, we just talked about, about how we are away from the Lord, but at home in the body. But one day, we'll be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Amen? Amen. And there's a sense in which we're never away from the Lord, of course. His promise is to always be with us, but heaven is going to be better. We will actually be with him. We will actually see him when we die and when we go to heaven. You see, right now, the body is a problem. See, the body has got limitations. Don't we know it? Okay? The body, we have to deal with these things that we call the desires of the flesh, if you know what I mean by that. We have conflicting needs for our body. Right now, the body is a problem. But in heaven... We will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. We won't have any of those issues with the body until the day, of course, that we get given a totally new perfect body which won't have any of those issues anyway. Amen? Amen. And we'll be present with the Lord. So in the realest, most tangible, touchable way, God will be there. Heaven will be a brilliant place. But best of all will be the fact that Jesus is there. Second thing I think we need to say is that heaven, sorry, time is going, but please bear with me because it's good. Heaven is a place where everything is better. Revelation chapter 21 verse 5 says, The one who was sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. That's the business God's in, you know. <coughs> new lives for old. New clothes for old rags. Making new creations all over the place. Whenever he makes something new, whenever the old is gone and the new has come, he always makes it better. Heaven is both now and the new heaven as well, a breathtaking place. It's going to be better because there will be no pain or suffering, we told in verse 4. So it's a place where we can never be hurt again. That's physically but it's also emotionally and spiritually. In fact, the very opposite is the true. A true. Everything exists in heaven for our total well-being. Those of you who have ever been in one of the funerals that I've conducted for a Christian will have heard me regularly say, listen, they're not dead, they're more alive than they've ever been. This includes no more sickness. We're told that there's a tree there for the healing of the nations. Heaven is a place of total well-being. We live forever in total good health. And that's important. Because, you know, we believe in divine healing. Don't we? We believe that God does heal today. But how often are we confused about the fact that we pray for healing and it doesn't seem to happen? I think there are perhaps lots of reasons for that. But partly I think it's because healing today is a foretaste of the glory of heaven. Of the total well-being and health that heaven will represent. By his spirit, 
God heals today. And in so doing, he points us in the direction of what heaven is going to be ultimately like. It means that when we do struggle with our ailments and our difficulties here, we can look to a time when actually we are going to be in perfect health. We are going to be in perfect well-being in heaven with Jesus. It describes what heaven is like, a place free of sickness and pain, and of course free of tears. There'll be nothing there to upset you. Ellie's in phrase at the moment is, that makes me sad. <laughs> She's great. She pulls on this face when she does it as well. So we're going around the shop and she says, oh, can I have that? And we say, no. She says, oh, that makes me sad. <laughs> Doesn't work. We still don't get it for her anyway. But, um, <laughs> but there'll be nothing in heaven to make us sad, which means it's a place of total peace. Jesus said, peace I give you. And that means no fear. It means no anxiety. It means no worry. It means no hatred. It's a place of total freedom and security. In every way, heaven is a place where everything is better. So can I ask you not to search for snails? You know what? There's an old legend about a swan and a crane. A beautiful swan alighted on the banks of the water in which the crane was wading around looking for snails to eat. For a few minutes the crane viewed the swan and then inquired, Where do you come from? I come from heaven, replied the swan. And where is heaven? asked the crane. Heaven, said the swan. You've never heard of heaven? And the beautiful bird went on to describe the grandeur of the eternal city. The streets of gold, the gates that were made of precious stones, the river of life, pure as crystal, upon whose banks is the tree that, that leaves is for the healing of the nations. In eloquent terms, the swan sought to describe the hosts who live in the other world. But it didn't arise the slightest interest on the part of the crane, who turned round and said, are there any snails there? <laughs> no, no, of course not, said the swan. Then you can keep your heaven. I want snails. Now, how often do we search around for snails? How often do we spend our time looking at the things that are really not important? How obsessed do we get with the things of this world that turn out just to be worthless in comparison with what God has got for us? We need to be focused on the here and now. Uh, sorry. It's so easy to be focused on the here and now and to forget about heaven, and that should not be the case. You see, heaven needs to be the priority in a sense because we will spend, what, 80 to 90, 100 years, if we're lucky, here on this earth. But we'll spend eternity there. We'll spend forever there. Because death isn't the end, it's just literally the beginning. To focus and define our lives on this tiny portion of it that we're spending on earth right now is to search for snails. It's to miss the important stuff. It's to miss the big picture. We live here on earth and of course, yes, we have to make the most of it. But we set our minds on things above, as the Bible tells us to do. It enables us to triumph in our sufferings when we do because we remember that our present sufferings are nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. Romans 8, 18. See, a heaven perspective causes life down here to make sense. It will lead to us being more confident, more full of faith, less likely to get locked down in the trivial, uh, more fruitful, and more comfortable in our own skin. Because death is not the end. It's only the beginning. And the Christian can look into the jaws of the grave and can declare death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.
Close your eyes for just a moment. Father, I pray that right at this moment you will cause us again to get a perspective and an understanding of how just glorious heaven is going to be. How amazing and how wondrous is this place that you have prepared for us. And your promise is that you have gone to prepare a place for us. Help us to remember that. So our understanding of a future world affects our lives in this one. I want to particularly challenge those that are watching who may never have ever made a decision to follow Jesus. You've never actually become a Christian. There's never been a time when you've made that decision to give your life to God. To take a look at the cross and see what Jesus has done and say, Jesus, thank you for the cross. Forgive me of my sin and make me a new person. And if you have never done that or you think you've never done that, then I cannot stress enough in the light of the stuff that we were saying in the first half of my preach, just how important it is that you do that. And right now, I want you to pray this prayer. You can repeat it quietly as I pray it. And then say amen at the end. It means I agree. And make it your own life choice. Father God, thank you for sending Jesus who suffered and died for me because of my wrongdoing, because of what the Bible calls sin. Thank you, Lord, I can be free of sin, free of guilt, and gradually and but definitely made more and more the person that you are calling me to be. And thank you that I can escape the punishment that my sin deserves. And I can see the doors of heaven with all of its glory open before me. Father God, today I put my trust in Jesus. I say, Lord, have my life and help me to follow you. Forgive me of my sin and make me a brand new person. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Trusting that there are those that have prayed that prayer today, please do not, do not just leave it at that. There is a number at the bottom of the screen, those that are watching online, get in touch with us via that number. It's the best way because, you know, you can send a message, but if we don't look at videos sometime in the future, we might miss you. Use the number, get in touch with us so we can help you begin that journey forward. If you're here in this building, and you prayed that prayer, then again, talk to us, please. Talk to me, and we can help you as we go forward. We're a little over time, but shall we sing one more song again and worship as we finish and as we take up our, uh, our offering um, and give to God? It's something that we do as part of our worship, so if you're our guest this morning, please don't feel that you have to give, but uh, we're very grateful if you do. God bless. We're going to sing a song called Room in My Heart and do this as just a bit of response time. Um, so this is a bit of space for you to just give yourself over to Jesus once again and say, God, it's you I'm living for. And also to, to pray for people that you know that need to know Jesus and ask God that he might stir on their hearts that they might make room for him too.
just given. Father, we pray. We thank you for the opportunity and the ability to give to you. We pray that what we've given today may be used for your glory and the extension of your kingdom in just the way that you would have it to to be done. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please don't rush off unless you have to. We're serving tea and coffee and other refreshments in the coffee shop. Uh, in the meeting place just straight the way through there and we would love you to stay and have fellowship together as we often say it's just as important in many ways what happens in there as what happens in here as we build one uh, one another up and build relationships with one another and encourage one another want to uh, 
uh, encourage you to, as well if you need any prayer. If you would like prayer ministry of any kind, Eric and Miriam will be just hanging behind for a li little bit and you can go to them. Uh, just in case you don't know who they are, Eric and Miriam, where are you? Will you give us a wave? Eric's there. Okay, Miriam's gone through there, isn't he? How did that happen? Okay. Wendy will help us, I'm sure. Yes, yeah. Wendy and, and Eric, if you want any prayer at all, please, uh, for any, any need, please uh, find them out and they will pray for you. Remember, we are on week two of 40 Days of Blessing uh, and that, uh, that sheet that you can follow is in the foyer for you to pick up if you've not received it by email already. Yes, Sarah? Um, if I can just add, as, as we have donated over 70 bottles, um, cartons of UHT milk, um, the use-by date is the first, and unfortunately the food bank won't be able to give them out after the first. So if any of you would like any UHT milk, we have over 70, <laughs> <laughs> 70 extra carbons today. And we also have some extra potted plants and some fresh vegetables um, that are free for you to help yourselves to. So if you're coming through to the coffee shop, um, if you aren't going into the coffee shop or would like some, then we'll put some by the other door as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Take 10 cartons and try and drink it by the end of tomorrow. It'll be great. <laughs> Let's say the grace, shall we? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God bless you. Please stay for a cup of coffee and don't forget to sign up for the party if you haven't done so already. Great to see you all. God bless. Have a great day.